space junk from the International Space Station may have slammed into someone's house. The Parker Solar Probe has amazing new videos from the sun, and the weather forecast for the eclipse looks terrible. These stories and more on this week's space news from Ad Astra. Welcome, I'm Swapna Krishna. Let's start with a weird and disturbing story. As first reported by Annalise Arola at Wink News, a piece of space junk that was possibly discarded from the International Space Station may have hit and damaged someone's home. Stephen Clark at Ars Technica has a great in-depth report on this, but basically, what happened was that on March 8th, homeowner Alejandro Otero, who was not home at the time, was contacted by his son, who said something from space basically landed on their house, ripping through the roof and both floors of his Naples, Florida home. The object was cylindrical and appeared to be human-made. Earlier that same day, almost three metric tons of space junk from the International Space Station entered the atmosphere in an uncontrolled re-entry. While space junk does often re-enter the atmosphere, it usually burns up. But this particular space junk contained a pallet of batteries that may have survived re-entry. To be clear, this was not the original disposal plan for these batteries. They were supposed to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere in a controlled manner in the Japanese HTV cargo spacecraft they originally launched in. But in 2018, a launch failure of the Soyuz threw the battery installation schedule off. This meant that after all the Japanese HTV spacecraft had departed space station, there was still one battery pallet left. The ISS jettisoned the batteries in 2021, and they've been orbiting the Earth ever since, and just now re-entered the atmosphere. It's not great, frankly. I feel like more and more of my stories right now are about space junk, but it's such a serious problem that we need to find a way to confront in a better manner. Usually NASA does require any launch provider it contracts with to leave enough rocket propellant available to be able to guide space junk away from the ISS, either in a controlled re-entry or just away from anything it could do damage to. What happened here is clearly not standard for NASA. They messed this one up. The good news is that everyone knows it. NASA repeatedly assured everyone that no pieces of this debris would survive re-entry. Clearly they were wrong. Experts did say that pieces would make it back to Earth because these batteries were made of nickel hydrogen and therefore too dense to completely burn up in the atmosphere. So what's next? Well, NASA has this piece of debris, they're analyzing it, and hopefully they get someone out soon to fix Alejandro Otero's home. Moving on to eclipse news. It's not great. Let's be honest, if you have looked at a cloud cover forecast for the eclipse at all, you'll know it's pretty bad for a lot of areas. Many of us made plans based on historic cloud cover, but now the forecast map for April 8th is completely opposite of historical trends. This is good news if you're north of Burlington, Vermont, and bad news if you're in Texas. This is the latest update from the National Weather Service before filming. According to this, there will be clouds along the bulk of the path of totality, with some breaks in between, but nothing is certain yet. It's very possible that some of these areas will have clouds as well, and some of the cloudy areas will have clear skies. I'm heading to San Antonio, which basically looks like it has some of the worst cloud cover possible. So you might be asking at this point, should any of us try and change our plans to be somewhere with less cloud cover? My personal answer is no. First, you're not gonna find any last minute lodging along the path of totality in the clear areas most likely. If you actually don't have plans to be in totality, but you'd like to, I would check some of these cloudy areas though, because my guess is people will start canceling reservations. It's hard to tell what will happen still. I personally take the chance rather than upending everything at the last second, but everyone's preferences are different. Speaking of the eclipse, a total eclipse is something that humans have experienced as long as we've been on this planet. But a new study preprint looks at whether human activity might change this eclipse for people. I've talked a lot about problems with satellite pollution for night stargazing. Remember when Starlink photobombed my northern lights photo from Iceland? It's a problem for ground-based astronomy, but it's also a problem for space-based telescopes like Hubble. Now, this paper is asking whether satellites will be visible to the human eye during the 2024 eclipse. This study focused on Starlink specifically because these satellites comprise about 60% of the 9,500 active satellites in orbit. 
In order to make satellite brightness predictions, the paper authors look at the reflectiveness of the satellite, which is determined by many things, including the satellite's surface area, the angle between the observer, the satellite, and the sun, and the satellite's range. This graph shows the visibility for satellites during the eclipse for the Kingston, Ontario area. The lower the magnitude, the higher the brightness. It's a complicated formula because the paper authors have to take into account the fact that the normally brightest satellites will be in the moon's shadow during the eclipse, but then they will reflect Earth shine. What's the result? Well, during the total solar eclipse, the sky won't be as dark as nighttime, so the paper authors determined that there will likely not be any Starlink satellites visible to the unaided eye. However, other larger satellites may indeed be visible. We'll just have to wait and see. Moving on to our sun. For the first time, the Parker Solar Probe captured the interaction between a CME, or a coronal mass ejection, which is a powerful explosion of magnetic fields and plasma on the sun, and solar wind. The results were published in the Astrophysical Journal, and the video is really cool. This has taken invisible light with the Parker Solar Probe's Whisper camera. I'm going to show this video twice, once at regular speed and then once at a slower speed so you can see what's going on. What you'll see is actually something scientists found surprising, the development of turbulence called Kelvin-Helmholtz instabilities. You can think of these as results of wind shear between low-level and high-level clouds within an atmosphere, but this is the first time we're spotting them in solar weather. Also, the fact that they're so large as to be present in a visible light image is really cool. Here's the video. You can see here the CME moving fast, and then here the solar wind moves in the opposite direction. I'll play it again slower this time. Notice on the right this time the box with the arrows. That is the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability. Here we go again. The CME is moving in, and then you'll see the solar wind from the opposite direction, and then the turbulence that creates. That final white streak is a line of solar plasma that's left over after the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability. Here's another view from the journal article. And just because I found this while I was digging around and I thought it was cool, here is a view of the Parker Solar Probe flying through the sun and looking out at the band of the Milky Way. I could honestly just watch this footage all day. Anyways, moving on. You've heard of Coordinated Universal Time, or UTC. What about Lunar Standard Time? This week, the White House instructed NASA to establish a standard of time for the moon, what it is calling Coordinated Lunar Time, or LTC, according to Reuters. Just as atomic clocks on Earth measure UTC, this might require the placement of these kinds of clocks on the moon. Coordinated lunar time would be something that the U.S. has to come to an international agreement on. Why do we need accurate lunar time? Well, as human activity on the moon increases, we need more precision. Things like GPS, which doesn't exist on the moon yet, but they require a precise location and also precise time. The idea is that LTC would establish the kind of precision necessary for things like synchronizing spacecraft, coordinating positions, and more. All right, because I have been updating you on it so far, Boeing Starliner's first crewed flight to the International Space Station has yet another launch date. This time, it is no earlier than May 6th. This is because of traffic and docking port availability at the International Space Station, not issues with the spacecraft that have been the problem in the past. This flight was initially supposed to launch in 2017, so I personally would love for this date to stick. The mission will take two astronauts, Sunita Williams and Butch Wilmore, to the International Space Station for about a week. And that is about all the news I have for you this week. Thank you for watching. I am Swapna Krishna, and this is Ad Astra.